Hughes has been privileged to work in virtually every part of the hospitality industry and loves taking on the challenges that come with running and growing business. Please welcome Deuce Raymond. Sarah, and she's here today supporting me as always. So, um, finished up at Kendall, and right then we opened up our first restaurant in 2005, and it was a Sweet Baby Ray's barbecue restaurant. Made all the mistakes that you can make in the restaurant business, but we're still open. So, early on in my career, it was really focused on competition barbecue. As it says, we have uh, 95, over 95 awards. Um, and then later on in my career, for the last two and a half years or so, I was really focused on social media. And we're going to talk a little bit about how we were able to grow to over 500,000 followers. And we get over 1.2 million impressions every single week. So we're very proud of that. And then in the last two years, our company has been able to double its sales. And we attribute that mostly to venue relationships and an awesome team and then also some of that marketing we just touched on. Now this is just a little sample of the preview of some of the stuff we're gonna talk about as, as it pertains to elevated barbecue. What to expect from the presentation, we're gonna talk about how stations can really give your guests an experience, and then we're gonna talk about how you might, if you have a traditional catering company, how you might wanna add barbecue to that as another revenue source. And then we're also gonna talk about adding international flavor profiles or your unique spin on things to really create some fantastic presentations. Uh, what makes great barbecue great in the first place and why am I so passionate about it? Well, I'm really excited about going outside with friends and family and cooking and that's really what attracted me to barbecue in the first place. I think barbecue is homey, it's approachable, it's not too hoity-toity. And what's really important for our business right now is barbecue is popular. And as an example of that, we're gonna do over 330 weddings this year. Half of those weddings are barbecue focused menus. So that shows you how much of a niche in the market that we have to sell barbecue to. And then to start off, we're gonna talk a little bit, a couple stories on the connections uh, barbecue has. Or, emotional connection people have with barbecue or food in general. So this story starts about two years ago when a brand new venue was opening up and our salesperson came to me and she said, Deuce, there's this new venue, but it's totally different than the other venues we work at. So most of the venues we go to are blank slates, pretty much. So they're exposed brick, 
farmhouses, warehouses, and you can transform them any way that the client wants them. This was finished, polished from head to toe, very LA vibes, very bougie, and you know, a fancy venue. Um, so when the owner approached us to come in and serving, doing the service and the food there, they were thinking of our True Cuisine brand, but I really wanted to go out on, a, on the ledge and say, I think we should do elevated barbecue. It's something different, it will set us apart. And Shuki, the owner, is a character, and he's literally the character from Father of the Bride that Martin Short plays. Like, he's crazy, eccentric, and we love him, but he is, has super high standards. And when I told him I wanted to serve barbecue at his high-end venue, he looked at me like I had three heads. But I you know, laid it out for him where I said, we're gonna do a brisket carving station, we're gonna use Wagyu brisket, we're gonna do house-made pickled vegetables, I'll work the carving station, and it's gonna be awesome. He was hesitant, but we went with it anyways. And so the day of the event came, and we did just that. Everybody was super stoked on the food. One thing I left out was that Shuki's partner is actually Jenny McCarthy's personal assistant. So she was gonna be there, of course we wanted to impress, and from that event, Jenny really was excited about our company. She and Donnie had a fundraising event a couple months later. She asked us to cater the whole thing. A couple weeks after that, she asked us to come to her house to serve and cater for her son's 21st birthday party. And this is the really the emotional part of the connection story I wanted to tell was after everybody was fed, uh, I found myself in Jenny's kitchen washing off my knife and Donnie came up to me and he said, hey Deuce, do you know why I love your brisket so much? And I said, no Donnie, what's up? He said, when I was just getting started out in the film industry in Boston, uh, I only had off one day a week, it was Sunday, and I would go down to the local barbecue spot and get brisket, come home just to chill on the couch and watch the NASCAR race. And when I have your brisket, it brings me back to those early days and it makes me so happy. And that hit me like a ton of bricks that you could connect with people and have them coming back over and over and over again to get your food if you can connect with them on a deeper level. Put the slide back up, would you? So then the picture in the middle, this is my personal emotional connection to food. So the picture in the middle is a rib recipe that my dad and my uncle entered into the Mike Reichel Rib Fest in 1985 that pretty much put Sweet Baby Ray's on the map. And this is a recipe, I'm gonna get emotional just for a second, so I'm sorry. We lost my dad a couple years ago, and every time I make this recipe, I know he's there with me. But it really, what I really remember about the recipe is he would make this, um, for every birthday, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm really sorry. Uh, for Fourth of July and everything like that, and it's just it just brings me back to those early days with the friends and family and everything. So it's just a very special recipe to me, and it just shows that emotional connection for food. And we let's get off this slide. <laughs> um, so th when I was putting this, uh, one second. When I was putting this presentation together, I wanted to think of a few ways to add value. If you're possibly not, by show of hands, how many people are in the barbecue space right now? So about half of you. That's good. So we'll take this a couple ways. The first way is if you're not in the barbecue space, but you run a full service, uh, full service catering brand. You have everything in place already. So the hard stuff is done. You have the staff in line, you have the equipment, the vehicles, the policies, the procedures, the front office, everything that it takes to, to run a catering company. A way to add some revenue is adding another brand, possibly barbecue would be my suggestion. And there is a huge market for it, at least in our neck of the woods. And like I said, half of our business is barbecue. Even though we have the high-end brand, we also do uh, wedding catering for barbecue specifically. So I think it's just there's some equipment, like smokers you might need, and some training you might need, but as much as all the other barbecue guys in the crowd might argue with me, barbecue's not that hard. You can learn how to do it. 
So I think that'd be an interesting way to add another revenue stream to your existing catering brand. But if you're in the barbecue space and you just want to start getting, layering in some higher end things or some fancier hors d'oeuvres or stuff like that, there's plenty of options out there. We're going to go through some pictures and some stations in a second. But for example, hors d'oeuvres, that's like really low hanging fruit in my opinion. Uh, this is a burnt end skewer. So all it is is a piece of brisket, roasted peppers and onions, and a couple homemade sauces. And it's something that looks amazing and melts in your mouth delicious. But if you want more hors d'oeuvre ideas or any recipe or item, menu item or ideas, you can go to our website at sbrcatering.com and just look through our wedding menu. There are so many different ideas there from smoked chicken quesadillas to pork belly crostinis. Um, there's a ton there. And after the event or when we get to the Q&A, you guys can ask, you know, ask me anything. I'm an open book. So, and just so you don't think I'm totally crazy, other companies besides ours has done this too. So Culinary Crafts, they are a staple here at Cater Source. I was blown away the first time I came here to Cater Source and watched their presentation on live fire cooking and how to bring that to uh, your event. It was amazing and it, they really kind of shaped me in the way that I wanted to take our barbecue catering company and kind of raise the bar for what barbecue can be. Uh, Cater by Design is another company that is traditional bar or traditional catering, but have added many different unique barbecue ideas to their menu. And then Keith A. Lord, he is a culinary innovator. He's actually going to be here tomorrow at one o'clock. I am definitely going to be at his presentation. He's going to talk a lot about similar stuff that we're talking about today, uh, adding unique concepts to your traditionally smoked barbecue. So. Keith is going to be here tomorrow. All right, now we'll get into the meat of the presentation, if you will. Quality meats is really what starts it out, and that's no revelation. Every cuisine starts with a quality product, and barbecue's no different. We use USDA choice beef every day of the week for the restaurant and for the catering business. Now, there's also other higher end options. If you have a client that has a big budget, you can go to the Wagyu and the to the heritage breed pork and to Amish chicken and things like that. But as long as you're you know, having a quality product, you're going in the right direction. Um, cooking it properly, you know, it's better to you know, keep it simple. Like they do here in Texas, salt, pepper, and smoke, you know, that's good enough. But we're gonna talk about adding a couple different flavors to it as well. And then I always think, you know, brisket looks great, you know, just sliced and put on a sheet tray with a little bit of uh, barbecue sauce. But you could take a couple extra strips and make it look like the one we have here that's a Korean inspired brisket sliced with sweet chili slaw. You get the sliced, the ends, some roasted peppers, and some goju jam barbecue sauce, and it looks beautiful. And then in the skillet is a smoked and seared tri tip with roasted peppers and onions and a little chimichurri sauce. So you can see, like, as long as you know the basics on how to cook the meat properly, presenting it really doesn't take that many more steps. Now we're going to go through a couple different elevated barbecue dishes, and then we're going to go through some buffet ideas as well. So this dish is very special to me. Um, it was for a fundraising event down in the city of Chicago a few years back, and a bunch of the top caterers, the big dogs in Chicago, were going to be there. And my mentor, Jimmy Banos, was there. Um, so I was super proud of how this dish turned out. They asked us to do the entree. So we did parsnip puree, the sliced Wagyu brisket, a little pickled vegetables, and our homemade barbecue sauce. And it just came out amazing. And I just love the way that plate looks. And it's simple but beautiful. And then we have our smoked salmon with DQ glaze. So this is a very functional dish. And when I say functional, I mean it's very easy to execute on site. So we take the Atlantic salmon, season it, and then smoke it for only like 10 or 15 minutes just to get the flavor on it. And then it goes in a pan ready to send out on site. And, on, and when they're on site, all they have to do is glaze it and pop it in the oven, and it's ready to serve on the ancient grains. The DQ glaze is a sauce that I made specifically for competition barbecue. It's a super high flavor profile sauce, and it's got a little bit of vanilla and fresh herb in it. 
and it's just a great plating sauce because it's got a great shine and it, it looks amazing on the plate. Then we have grilled tri-tip. And I didn't just put this picture up here because it looks beautiful, which it does, my humble opinion. Um, but tri-tip is a great cross-utilized meat. So we use it in so many different ways in our catering business. We take the tri-tip, we can use it for plating like this, we can use it for carving stations, and then we can also use it to cook and cool and slice it thin for sandwiches. We use that same meat for uh, Chicago-style Italian beef. Then we can also use it for skewers. We could chop it up for carne asada. It's one of those things that we have tri-tip and we use it all over the place. So that's a great, great tip if you guys aren't into tri-tip. And this is the big one is the price point is amazing. It's $4.60 a pound, at least up in Chicago right now. Um, so tri-tip is a great one. Now, when I talk about elevated barbecue, it's not just the food that we put on the plate or in the chafing dish, it's how we set it up. So we're gonna, th there's a couple slides just uh, of some images of how we set up our buffets. And so this one is a little bit of an extreme version with the shelving unit and everything, but you can see you want different lighting, different textures, different colors, and it really sets off the food. It makes it an experience, not just four buffets, across, or four shafers across the table with a stack of plates and some bottles of sauce at the end. We don't play like that, okay? So we're gonna set it up. I'll show you a couple different examples. So this is another image, and there's a lot of little things that we have accumulated over the years, like the pig in the background. That will go out to different buffets. You really want different elevation and different colors, and a couple little things to tweak your buffets just to make it look beautiful. Now this one was from an event we did over the summer. And you can see the chafing dishes in the front, the two half chafers. We make these in-house. So we make halves and we make fulls. We paint them black for the True Cuisine brand and we do the wood tones for Sweet Baby Ray's. This is a great thing to do in the first quarter. You guys are just like we are where it's slow in January, February, and March. That's why you're able to come here today. And this is something, we built 88 full shafers uh, last year in the slow time. Um, but what I wanted to say about this slide was that this is our standard. This is how we set up our buffets and all of our staff knows what to expect when they get on site. There's gonna be a crate of succulents and we make all these succulents in house too. We have, buy the boxes, we buy the succulents on Amazon and we build them ourselves and glue them in place. Mike, I don't even know if he's in here. Is Mike here? Sarah, is Mike here? Oh, uh, he left. Anyways, sorry. Our product guy, he designs all this stuff. So um, when you go to the event, the servers, they'll have a crate of risers, a crate of candles, a crate of succulents, and then they'll be able to set up the buffet like this. So you don't have to do it just like this. Obviously, there's other ideas you can have, more brick, more um, of those you know, pigs and different, different things you can set it up with. But the point is to get away from just the shapers across the table. Because it doesn't, in my opinion, doesn't cost that much and it doesn't take that much more effort to make it look like this versus the, rather, the other. All right, now we're gonna talk a little bit more about international flavor profiles. So when I was at Kendall College, the last two years was really heavily focused on international cuisine. And we were really lucky because we were the first graduating class and they really didn't know what they were doing. They put together this curriculum, but they put a ton of money at it. And really what that meant was there were chefs that we got to work with from all over the world. And that has stuck with me my whole career. And anytime I'm coming up with a new menu item or filming another video, I really lean into the international flavor profiles because to me, I really think it's fun and it's actually easy because you can use smoked meats as a canvas and then apply different flavors and different dishes to that. So in the top, we have the beef ribs. And of course, we're in Texas, so I had to put the beef ribs in there. This is actually a jerk beef rib. 
So we did jerk seasoning, smoked it for four or five hours till it was tender, and then glazed it with a sweet glazed and finished it with the mango salsa. Very delicious. And then the top video is a chicken tikka skewer and very similar flavor profile, but what we did was we marinated it, then we smoked it, and then we finished it on the grill, and we took our Alabama white gold barbecue sauce and then infused that with red curry paste and ginger and garlic. And then on the bottom, this is of the three, probably the one I was most excited about, and it's ribs. So I cook a ton of ribs. Uh, our company cooks a ton of ribs. I've eaten a lot of ribs, and this one really stood out to me last year. Um, it's baby back ribs with a salt pepper cumin rub, and then we smoked it and finished it on the grill with an agave glaze, and then finally, what we'll put it over the top was the chimichurri. So really a rich, fatty meat with that fresh chimichurri and garlic um, was really delicious. Uh, okay, now, if there's one thing, they're gonna bring out this buffet so you guys can see it. Now, if there's one thing to take away from this presentation, I think this is it. Coming up with a station like this barbecue fondue um, is a great idea, and we have used this so many different ways, whether it be corporate events, whether it be weddings and at the cocktail hour or a part of a, like a station menu where there's a taco bar, a mac and cheese bar, a barbecue station, this could be the barbecue station. And when it comes down to it, it's just, it's really four different smoked meats on the different risers with then four different barbecue sauces. And the whole point behind this station is to get people interacting with the food. And you know, that's one thing I was gonna point out earlier with the stations. Now, you guys have been in catering for a while. Everyone's had a station. You've seen a carving station or whatever, but I think people really need to lean into the stations. It's underrated and undervalued. And that's something where, like in the story I was telling about the new venue, do you think that they would have had the same experience if we were just slicing a tenderloin that they had a thousand times? No, because we did elevated barbecue. And the fact that I was behind the station slicing it telling them how special it is and what's special about it, that chance is, uh, gives you a chance to interact with your clients. And what we have talked a lot about in our business is when we're at the event that night, we're executing, that by, uh, we're executing the event that evening to the best of our ability, but we're also trying to sell the next event. So there's people at that event, could be 150 people, coming through that buffet line, and if you have a chance to impress upon them, give them an experience, they'll remember you when they need catering. So I think the team was gonna bring this table out, but I might be a little early. So at some point, they're gonna bring the table out and you guys can take some pictures, but it's gonna look like this. Um, now we'll talk a little bit about the oper operational efficiencies of barbecue and why I think barbecue is a perfect fit for catering. Um, barbecue makes catering easier because of the hold time. So when we cook our brisket and our pork shoulders, basically we season them, we put them on at six at night, and then six the next morning they come out. So they're tender and hot and ready to go then, but what really makes barbecue good is the rest time. So we wrap it up, put it in the hot box at about 145 degrees and let it rest. So coming, coming out at six in the morning, we might not be serving till six at night at that carving station I was talking about, but by the time it rests for 12 hours, it's so tender and supple and succulent that it's just the product from right when it comes out of the smoker to letting it rest is night and day. And People all the time say that this is the best brisket I've ever had, or it reminds me of the brisket I had in Texas, and it really should because the same method that they use at Franklin's and Terry Black's and all the places right around here that you guys might have been to, that's the same method that they use. They cook it for a long period of time till it's tender, but then they even rest it almost just as long as they cooked it for, and that's really what makes barbecue special and, and gives it that nice texture and tenderness to it. 
So why is that important for catering? Because everything else in catering is a la menu, right down to the wire. When the tenderloin's done, you have to serve it. When the hors d'oeuvres are ready, you have to put them out. And barbecue gives you that little saving grace where, especially when you're going on site, you know the briskets and the pork is good. You just keep it in the hot box till you're ready to serve it and put it out when it's ready. Everything else is kind of like hustle bustle, get it ready to get out. So um, hot boxes, the only thing I'll say about that is if you lean more into barbecue, you might need more hot boxes because of that hold time. Types of smokers, I have a couple slides coming up about that. And then the mobile kitchen, one thing I'll say about the mobile kitchen is we do it differently than a lot of caterers, at least in Chicago, because I know how some of them operate. But when we go on site and we're cooking on site, we take a box truck with a full propane oven, like an oven you would have in your catering kitchen, and then we have the S2 burners and caves, and with, the, with that equipment, we could produce pretty much any type of event. So the, the meat is smoked, but then there are durs that have to be finished in the oven, the side dishes might have to get finished in the oven, and then we have caves for holding, and that's how we like to produce a full service event. Now I'm just gonna run through a few types of smokers. The barbecue people um, are gonna know exactly what I'm talking about here. Um, Southern Pride is what I use, and that's what I started with, that's what I think is the best, and it has never done me wrong. And Southern Pride is a gas assist smoker, so you set the temperature, the gas fires the wood that's in the chamber, and it's, it's very consistent, it holds its temperature. Once it drops below five degrees from where you set it, the gas turns back on, and you're pretty much set it and forget it. Another special thing about the Southern Pride is that it's a rotisserie. Almost all Southern Pride's are rotisserie, and that gives you kind of a self-basting. So as that meat cooks, it renders and drips on itself, and it just, you know, creates a very nice cooking environment. It's nice and moist and delicious. So Southern Pride is what I use. They do not pay me to say that, but they should. <laughs> Old Hickory is kind of like the competitor to Southern Pride. Both of them are gas assist smokers. Both of them are amazing pieces of equipment. I have nothing against Old Hickory. I just started using Southern Pride, so that's what I use. There's guys here in the crowd will probably say the same things I say about uh, Southern Pride will say, they'll say about Old Hickory. Um, very similar in concept. Um, most Old Hickories are set shells, and the only difference is, the, the reason Old Hickory might be, um, one of the advantages for Old Hickory is because it's a little more affordable, not just the purchase price, but also the repairing. Because Old Hickory is more like Ford and GM, where all their parts are, you know, standard, where Southern Pride makes some of their own parts, so you have to find a mechanic or a technician that can fix a Southern Pride. Not everybody knows the, the whole deal with it. So uh, Old Hickory is a little easier to repair that way. Now I'm showing these two examples because this is what I suggest for catering. What I don't suggest is this. And I'll tell you why, but I think, and I'm not saying this because we're in Texas, I'm saying this because I know it to be true from my experience. I think the best barbecue comes off of these type of pits, or a pit similar to this. And when, before we opened our first restaurant, Dave and I came down to Texas, and we ate at 26 barbecue restaurants in four days. And we went all around Central Texas and the Hill Country, right around here. And it was amazing, it blew my mind, it really kind of raised my bar of what I thought great barbecue was, and it's something I strive to do every time I cook barbecue, I still am trying to you know, reach that pinnacle. The problem with these are, is they're very labor intensive. And when you're running a full service catering company with all these different cook times and menu items and you know delivery times and everything like that, that this is very hard to manage. It's basically every 45 minutes you have to load that firebox. And while it makes delicious barbecue, it just takes a lot of labor to run one of these smokers. Now, if you just have a barbecue restaurant or you're only doing barbecue catering, you could probably get away with it and you'll figure it out and, you know, having multiple smokers that different temperatures and stuff like that would help. 
But for a full service catering company that's doing multiple things, I think the, the old hickory or the southern pride is the way to go. But if you're cooking on one of these smokers, okay, they're coming. Um, then God bless you, and I'm coming to eat your barbecue because I love meat off these smokers. Everybody ooh and ah. Yeah, here we go. This is the barbecue fondue. So they're going to come. All right. So we're going to, you guys are going to come, you can come look at this when we're done with the presentation. All right, so. This is a slight departure of Elevated Barbecue, but this is actually what I pitched to Kathleen when, I, when she asked me to speak. I said, let me talk about something other than just food only, because I could do a whole class on this, but we just got two slides. And I think there's a lot of value here because I think a lot of people in the catering industry really struggle with what to post and stuff like that to build their brand. So I'll just tell you what we do. I'm not going to tell you what you should do, or I'm just going to say what we do. But basically, we do what's called pillar content. So as far as the marketing goes, and it's all based around educational barbecue. So there's something to do with barbecue here. But pillar content really means that every single week we shoot one video. From that one video, we get a main TikTok which is a minute and 30 seconds long. Then from the raw footage of that, we get 15 to 20 pieces of micro content. That's anything from 15 seconds to 60 seconds that we can post on all those platforms, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Reels, and YouTube Shorts. We also get a written recipe, we also get a blog post, and we also get still images. So. From that one video we shoot once a week, we get 30 pieces roughly of content every single week. And we've been doing that for the last two and a half years. So we have endless content because we shoot one video, but we use it all the content we get from that one video very wisely. And I did not come up with this. This is something that Gary Vaynerchuk preaches about if you guys see him on social media. Um, but it's something that we've used and we've been very successful using. The one thing I'll say about it is that when you're posting short form video content, and that's where you'll get growth, by the way. You're not gonna get growth from sh posting uh, pictures and stuff like that, but if you post short form video content that adds value that people are interested in, that is how you can grow your brand on social media. What I see with catering companies mostly, and I know because I see, I follow catering companies just like you guys follow other people in the industry, is they're posting videos and pictures of their last event that it looks good. Like, I'm not saying that we don't do the same thing. It looks good and other people in the industry are gonna say, yeah, that was a great event and stuff like that. But it's more of a flex than doing anything for your brand because it's only getting the people that already follow you. The only way to grow on social media today is posting short form video content that adds value that people are interested in. And that's not my opinion. That's not me just sitting up here saying it. That's what the platforms are telling you by how their algorithms work, okay? So that's what they want, to, want you to post and that's what they're gonna push out for more information. Um, so I'm gonna show you a couple examples of what we do is bar educational barbecue. And this is what we've had success with. This is the only topic that I can ramble around every week, once a week for. So that's why we do educational barbecue. So we're gonna do a couple samples here just so you guys see what we are talking about. Our show is called Barbecue Like a Bo Boss. We post once a week on TikTok. And basically it's tips and tricks about barbecue.
I left my clicker over here. All right, one more video. All right, guys, so that's, that's an example of the short form video content that we do. Um, one other thing I wanted to say about it is, I'm not, I didn't say one word about catering in there. You know, we're not selling catering. We're giving, we're giving, we're giving. Like Gary Vee says, jab, 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 right hook. You know, eventually when people see these videos enough, when they think about catering, like because this is under the profile name Sweet Baby Ray's Catering, they're gonna say, oh yeah, we did see that video. So that's how we sell, but basically it's growing your brand and the attention on your brand. Okay, key summaries and takeaways. Uh, barbecue is approachable, interactive, and nostalgic. I think it's so important to lean into those stations to get some interaction with your clients. And that's what I see where we can add a lot of value and really sell that next event and that's what I'm really excited about. I'm hoping that you guys take some of that energy from me and bring it to your catering company and have your salespeople be able to you know, get excited about selling that carving station because it can really give your guests a different experience. Like how much better is it to get brisket carved from a chef to put on your plate? Just like you go to a barbecue restaurant down here, you see the meat right in front of you, they slice it, oh, do you want the fatty or the lean? We do that same thing at our catering events and people get excited about it and they remember it and they want to come back for more. Um, unique flavors and international uh, flavor profiles to elevate your barbecue. This is easy to me because there's so many different flavor profiles out there and every cuisine has some touch of barbecue in it. And I think that that's something that I get excited about because there's just so many options there just like we saw with the jerk or the South American flavor profile or Indian flavor, flavor profile or Asian flavor profile, there's even more. Um, so the displays we talked about, the buffets, so like this, different heights, different pieces of greenery. I don't know if they can put this on the screen up there. No, I'm not in control of that. There we are. So you can see different elevation, greenery, textures, and the way this works is, it's not in here now, but there would be sternos under here, candles underneath the sauces to keep those warm. And again, this doesn't break the bank, it's not so crazy, you guys could, if I could do this, I know you guys could do this, believe me. I, this is not that difficult to set up. So. Uh, it's something that's really, really worked well for us, but not just for the barbecue fondue station, but any of your buffets with the chafing dishes. If you get a little bit of elevation, use something like an alternative chafer with putting your beans or your mac and cheese in a skillet instead of a chafing dish. In. So get away with, you're not allowed to put four chafers in a row anymore. You have to do at least two and then do two skillets or something. 
um, so, so this is what we're talking about with the stations. Okay, I skipped something, but now we're on Q&A. What did I skip? Uh, the whole time we talked about a lot already, so I think that that whole time is something really to lean into and use to your benefit, whether you run a restaurant or a catering business. Everything else, it, it seems to me, in catering is at the last second. So having that whole time really gives you something that you can, you know, have a little saving grace with. And then uh, the, the experiences with the carving stations and the barbecue fondues, really think that there can be a lot from that, especially in looking at it from, this can get you the next event. And not just how we're gonna execute that event, but what are we doing to sell the next event while we're there? And the carving stations, one, you can charge more for it, and two, it's gonna bring you more business. So it's like a win, 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 in my opinion. But we are gonna have a little bit of time for Q&A, so please, you guys, ask questions. Otherwise, my wife's gonna have to ask like six questions. So thank you all very much. <laughs> thank you. Yes, sir, there's got a the mic. He's got a question. Well, sh they wanna get this for the recording. Right here. You passed them up. Good question. So one thing we do, a couple things. 250 people is a lot. You would need at least two or three of these stations for 250. This is good for, you know, up to 100, I'll say. But what we'll do is we'll have multiple skillets and then be preheated in the caves. So we'll come out, and there's not that much, so you're bringing out fresh food, but you'll have to have a backup in the back, so you just bring out a whole skillet that's full. But there's gonna be sternos underneath here that help keep it warm, too, for sure. But yeah, it's, it's not like a shaper with a lid on it, so it doesn't stay as hot, but if you got a crowd and they're coming through and going through it, it's not a problem to keep it warm because you have a whole left, or uh, what's it called, backup in the cave that's in a preheated skillet already. Correct. Yes. Good. Good question. So he said, how do you charge for decor? What we do is we roll it into the SCP fee. So special event production fee, that's 12.5% on top of everything else. So that covers all of this type of stuff. Um, what we say is like the loading and unloading and washing the dishes and you know, kind of everything that has to do with an event that's not, that you don't see at the event necessarily. But yeah, that covers our cost for this, uh, this type of setup. It's a special event production, 12%. I've heard of as high as 20%. That's one of those things when I said we learned a lot when we first started coming to Cater Source, we weren't charging a special event production. And that, you know, that's basically the profit of your whole event. If you're t taking 12% out of an event, you're doing good. So that's what we do. Chip, you have to ask at least one question. Because you ask me questions on Facebook all the time. So don't be shy now. So how do you, you said you have the stuff like that. Yep. Yeah, it's something, you, what you could do with the sterno is now, depending on how high your riser is, you might want it wide open because it's high, but what we'll do is when you have a sterno, you can kind of put the lid off halfway, so that usually keeps it from burning, but this is a station that needs attention, for sure. You have to have a server there kind of stirring the meat, making sure that the stuff is, you know, not getting too hot on the bottom and stuff like that, so it does take a little bit of effort. Um, but I think it, it's outstanding the way it looks and everything, but it does take some extra attention like that for sure. Do you have other costs besides the one you just mentioned on your invoices, like the labor? And that's 
Yes. Is this all built into the one price? No, we charge separately for labor, for sure. When we, when we serve uh, buffets like this and full service events, our labor's charged it, you know, it all varies on what type of people are going, but it's a four hour minimum per person, for sure. So, you know, if we have an event director, servers, chefs on sites, they all get charged out separately for that. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yep. What is your top three most popular meat choices? Top three most popular meat choices for catering are brisket is our number one. We sell the most amount of brisket. And then it's pulled pork and bone and chicken. We sell those three the most. We do not sell a lot of ribs. I wish I could sell more ribs, but we, have, we charge extra for ribs and we just don't sell that many ribs. Brisket's their number one seller right now. Even though we do charge more, for more for it, I just think that shows on how popular barbecue is. Uh, yes, do it. Oh, like cooked meat? Whew, good question. Uh, is there, he wanted to know, is there any products that you could do that come in smoked already that you're not cooking yourself? I think there are some good products out there, but I just haven't tried any. But I mean, the stuff like uh, the last guy before me was doing sous vide and he had a brisket that was cooked and chilled down and brought up the temperature of the bag. It looked really good to me. So I, I'm sure there are some, there's one company called Austin Blues. Yeah, that's right. You like it? Yeah, yeah, it's very, very good. Okay, so yes, I think there are, that is very smart. Yeah. See, that's amazing. That's good, good information to have because if you don't have a smoker and you still want to do a station like this, it's definitely manageable. That's amazing. Do we have more people? Here, right up in front. Yep. Yeah, I'm going to get the mic too. Good. Uh, it's terrific. This presentation really is amazing. Thank you so much. I, I actually work for Stir Fry, so it's great to hear you using our product. And yep. Yes, we did. Yes. Grill partner. Yep, we have used those in the past for sure. Vegan? Yeah. Smoked Brussels sprouts and mushrooms. And the other thing we do a lot of is jackfruit. So he asked for all vegan options. That we smoke, we actually sell more jackfruit than the Brussels sprouts. But those two items, as far as barbecue goes, smoked jackfruit with barbecue seasoning and barbecue sauce, and then the Brussels sprouts and portobello mushrooms smoked with our rub on them. Those are two options that we do. I mean. There's a lot of other vegetarian options out there, but as far as a barbecue focused one, those are two that work for us. Yes, ma'am. Well, that's tough. <laughs> well, basically what you need is set up a cleaning schedule. Every two weeks on Sunday, you pretty much have to take all the racks out and pressure wash it if you don't want to do any of those to uh, get any of that black gunk. But you're going to get some of that, and I don't think you need to smoke or wash it every night. Some places do it like that, but I think every, depending on your volume, every week or every two weeks, if you get a pressure wash in there, rinse it out, drain it out. Do you have like a Southern Pride or an Old Hickory? Yeah. You don't put any soap on it, just water, pressure wash with water. Oh, for sure. I got guys that get in our smokers with the pressure washer. Yep. 
Yes, sir. What's our event size? Average. average event size is uh, for weddings are about 150, and then for corporate it varies so much, anywhere from 35 to you know 500. So it varies, but wedding very average is 150 for us. And we'll do plated weddings. So some of those other plated dishes, that's for like a plated uh, barbecue event. And then stuff like this would be more for like a buffet style wedding. Thank you. Yes, sir. Back here. Where am I? Right oh, there you are. What's up? Do we? <laughs> no, just that special event. Special event production fee is the one service fee that we charge, but we also serve, have labor charge on top of that. Is that special event production fee every event, or is there a service Every event that's full serviced. Yep. This, someone over here, yes sir. Um, to be honest, I think it's like probably 85% gas. Yeah, splits, yep. But it still makes a smoke ring, and I, I, the flavor from the Southern Pride and the Old Hickories is great, don't get me wrong. It's just, I think you can tell the difference between like traditionally like cooked Texas meat versus the Southern Pride, but it's great. And especially up in Chicago, not everybody knows the, about the barbecue down here, so. Where are we at? Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Um, we do a lot of task orders for our events. Good. Especially like some of our corporate. And in one of your slides, you guys said almost like a skewer, like a yes. skewer, right? Yes. Yep. Can you tell me what you guys do, what cocktail like that that you do that would be for sure. And be able to be tasked? For sure. Yeah, we do a lot of them. One is that on the screen, that was our burnt end skewer. And that's a top piece of the brisket with roasted onions and peppers. And then we do a house-made competition sauce, so like a sweet tomato sauce, and then a mustard sauce, because it looks really cool on the plate with a little chopped parsley. Another one we do that's not meat-based, but it's like barbecue influence, like because it's southern influence, is a peach basil skewer. So we make a goat cheese croquette, a little piece of fresh peach, and then a peach basil vinaigrette. That is one of our top sellers, and it hits the vegetarians, and it kind of fits the barbecue theme. Um, we do a ton of bacon-wrapped dates. It's not super barbecue-y, but it does have bacon-wrapped dates with a brown sugar glaze, meatballs, barbecue meatballs we sell all day long. And then the other one we do that we've been selling a lot is we'll do, that's again, not meat-based, but barbecue-based, is a, a cornbread fritter. So we make cornbread in a sheet tray, cut it into cubes, do a standard breading procedure and deep fry it, and then we can just bump it on site. Super good food cost. And a little uh, honey jalapeno sauce on top, and it's a one biter that is delicious, and it's like pennies to make, and we can charge a couple bucks for an uh, appetizer that way. But if you go to our web, please go to our website and look, there's 30 of them on there that are barbecue influenced, sbrcatering.com. Yes, that's a good question. So some of them are from American Metalcraft. Other ones we just search on um, Amazon like if we're looking for succulents and stuff. And like I said, Mike will get the, let me see if I can go back to that one slide. I don't know if it's gonna let me. I'm not in control anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, so if you buy succulents on site, on Amazon or something like that, then you can put them inside the boxes and you can kind of build them yourself. Or you could go, I mean, if you don't do it that way, it gets a little expensive, but they're really not that bad. And you can use them over, and then once like uh, the slow season hits, then we'll kind of like refurbish them, because they'll like get a little gunky or fall apart or something, and then we'll put them back together. But the succulents, is, it's, it just makes such a difference, it really does. Is the sand from the American Metalcraft? Yes, yeah, the stuff like this, the stands, these little bowls, 
and you could get all sorts of stuff from them. Yeah, those are like pizza stands. They, American Metal Craft, these are less expensive ones. American Metal Craft has, um, their stuff is a little pricey, but it's really good quality, for sure. We get a lot of stuff from them. Yes, ma'am. No? You're stretching? Oh, there's one in back. So, good question. Are you doing anything to prevent your meats from drying out in the hot box during that hold time? Really, all we do is we wrap the pork shoulder in plastic and we wrap our brisket in butcher paper. Those two things. But it's really, they're made to hold for a long time. There's so much intermuscular fat that they're going to hold as long as the temperature's not too hot. 140 degrees, 145 degrees, and you're set. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's a good question. Uh, she asked, oh, you had the microphone, so they heard you. Good. Um, typically, when we do stations, it's more like an American barbecue station, and then there's a taco bar or a risotto station or something else. It's not really too intermixed. Although, with this fondue station, I've been playing around the idea with doing different international flavor profiles for each meat and sauce. So, having like a Korean brisket with gojujan sauce, and then more of an Indian flavor profile on the chicken, like a chicken tikka, and then like a chicken tikka sauce, and stuff like that. So I think with this station, you could really mix and match, but typically we'll do whole stations as one theme. Anybody else? Awesome. Well, thank you guys. Good questions. Appreciate it.